Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at the Fifth Avenue Synagogue Sunday Speaker Series. Um, our rabbis teach us that uh, before the holiday of Pesach, we're meant to prepare. We need to clean our house. We need to organize. We need to uh, prepare uh, kosher Pesach food. And we also have to prepare uh, spiritually. Uh, we have to learn the laws so we know what to do and what not to do. And we have to get ourselves uh, mentally prepared uh, there is a tradition actually to read the Haggadah, the Shabbos before Pesach, in order to uh, prepare themselves for the holiday. Uh, so tonight we have the opportunity to hear from Rabbi Saul Young Rice uh, from Hineni, the Hineni organization, a dear friend of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. Uh, Rebbetzin Young Rice has spoken at the shul many, many times, has many connections to uh, various members of our community. And it's a great honor for us to have Rabbi, Rabbi Young Rice uh, address us this evening. He'll be speaking about different lessons of the Haggadah that can enhance our Seder. And it's a very busy time of the year. I'm sure you have a lot to do. So it's, uh, we're very appreciative uh, the fact that you were able to carve some time out to address our community this evening. Thank uh, you so thank much. Thank you very much, Rabbi. I'm going to call upon Rachel and Barry to formally introduce you. Okay, Rachel? Thank you so much. Well, it, it's just a pleasure and a privilege to introduce Rabbi Yisrael Youngreis, the son of Rabbitson Esther Youngreis, a beloved memory. The rabbi is someone that Barry and I think of as family, someone who has shared our deepest joys. In fact, he was the rabbi who married us and someone who has steadied us during times of challenge. We are always grateful for his wisdom and his guidance, including the daily Torah oxygen, as he calls it, that he provides on a daily phone call at 1220 each weekday. Tonight, Rabbi Youngrice's topic is lessons from the Haggadah to enhance your Seder. Rabbi, we thank you for joining us tonight and know that your insights will uplift our Seder and, and those who are on the call. And now Barry will also share a few words. Rabbi Youngrice is an extraordinary rabbi that our family has had the honor of knowing and having him be involved in all of our family affairs for a very long time. Um, him, he and the Canadian organization really were responsible for us, Rachel and I being married, and for my brother and his wife being married, uh, Rebbitz and Esther Youngrice, who uh, introduced Rachel and I, and who was really one of the most important people in my life, um, used to say all the time when Rabbi Youngrice came to the stage, when they used to have thousands of people come to listen to the weekly Torah class, she would say, and now for the best part of the evening, Israel <laughs> yeah, Youngrice. I forgot, so, I forgot about that. It hasn't changed. It's still the same. Well, it's not, nothing oh. like a mother with giving praise to a son. No, no, no. It's she, your mother, was. she was right about almost everything that she was right about. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. Well, and as Rachel said, Rabbi Youngrice married the both of us, and he's really been a, a tremendous help to us over the years. And, you know, the one thing that's that that when I whenever I think of Rabbi Youngrice, what's so special about him is that he really always has a lesson of kindness to say. And if you follow his his teachings and his his basic interpretations of the Torah, he always looks for the kind, nice way and mensch like way to be. And it's really he's just a great, great inspiration. And the Jewish community is lucky to have him and our, our wonderful synagogue is lucky to have you tonight as a speaker on this special occasion before Pesach. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you, Jacob. Well, thank you for thank that you, thank wonderful you, introduction. And so just let me start. With, you have to always praise the Achsanya, the host, the host is Fifth Avenue Shul. I like going there to Davin, it's always a good place to go. And every time I walk in there, it's there's a tremendous uh, hospitality there, always a big welcome. I want to thank Rabbi Babich, I want to thank Jacob Gold, and of course, um, Barry and, and Rachel. So Mr. Shem, six nights, six nights from tonight, Mr. Shem will be sitting at our table of Malachim, which is the table of kings, the royal Seder table. And, you know, everyone has Seder memories. You ask anyone, tell me about the Seder when you're growing up, something will come to their mind right away. There was a story about the Chafetz Chaim, when he was ready very old, and he wanted to move to Eretz Yisrael, and his uh, student says, Chafetz Chaim, Rebbe, you cannot go, and Chafetz Chaim says, why can't I go? I'm an old man, and the students told the Chafetz Chaim, when the Zayda sits at the table, people act differently, so when you think about Seder memories, you think about a Zayda, a Babi, a father, a mother, songs, traditions, you think about 
memories and right right away things are things you never forget in life and when you conduct the seder this is how your children will conduct the seder and their children and their children every morning we say a special bracha it's called bircha satora the blessing for the Torah. And this is the Baruch of Aharav no Hashem Elokeinu. Please, Hashem, sweeten the words of Torah in our mouths, our children's mouths, or in our children's children's mouths. So tonight I would like to share some lessons that I've learned in my own home, lessons from my Rabbeim over the years, lessons I've picked up, and uh, hopefully uh, this way we could all enhance our Seder. I was discussing with Jacob before we started, and a lot of Jacob made a very good point. A lot of times, people at the Seder, you just go through the text of the of the Haggadah and just go through all of the the, the, the Simonim and the Matzahs. You know, they're just going according to the text. But there's a deeper meaning to the Seder because Pesach is also a time that parents and grandparents or anyone at the table can talk about their personal Pesach. If someone had a big change in their life, if they, let's say they found Hashem after twenty or thirty years, you talk about that at the table. Someone has gone through some some challenges, and he's so young. And at the seder, you could you could tell everyone, Baruch Hashem, Hashem, we had a challenge this year, and Baruch Hashem, the challenge is over, and we have to be very grateful to Hashem. It's a time of hakaras, a tov, gratitude. It's a time of amuna, trust and faith in Hashem. It's not just the text of the Haggadah. Personal lessons, personal reflections, and people will never ever forget these lessons. So I want to start first lesson tonight is the power of prayer on Seder night, tefillah. And there's a connection between Purim and Pesach. What's the connection? For, oh, like four weeks ago, we're reading the, the, uh, the Megillah, and it says, Queen Esther says to, to all the Jews, and Mordechai, Lech Kenos is called Ayhudim, go and gather all the Jews, but Sumo Alai, and fast for me, a three-day fast. Fast for me, and and she and she said, Queen Esther, I will, and those in my in, in my entourage will fast also. That fast, that three day fast was Pesach. There was no Pesach that year. There was no Pesach. Remember, many years ago, we went to my parents' house for Pesach, and two hours before Yontiv, all the families were there. My mother receives a phone call that my Zayda, my mother's holy father, was taken to the hospital. Brookdale Hospital, he had a stroke. And my mother's dropped everything and she went and she spent Seder two nights of Yontav with my Zayda in the hospital. And then when, and when she came home after the second Seder, the second night of Yontav, my four-year-old son said to her, Bubba, you miss Pesach, you miss Pesach. So that year with Queen Esther, we miss Pesach. And the, our sages asked a question, the whole decree that Haman had against the Jewish people was not that night. It was months later. So if Mordechai wanted to declare a day of fasting and a day of prayer, the best time to do that would be Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sarah Simei Chuba, 10 days of repentance. Why miss Pesach? Why miss Seder? So Mordechai knew he was a novi, he was a prophet, and he knew that this gezerah, this decree was sealed in the heavens above. And once the decree is sealed, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, they're not going to break it. There's only one night of the year when a gezer, a God forbid, can be broken, and that's Seder night, Leil Shemurim. So that's why Queen Esther said, we have to fast tonight, and there's no Seder this year. So I just wanted to read to you an incredible letter. This was a Shabbos Haggadol speech. We just had Shabbos Haggadol yesterday, and this is from Rabbi Elio Gutmacher, who was, see, he was the student of Rabbi Akiva Eger. And he speaks about the, how powerful Lel Seder is regarding prayer. He says, even greater than Yom Kippur. Im adam mazel ra, the Eze Inyan, a God forbid a person has bad mazel in anything in life. And then if he says, in Parnassa, making a living, bad mazel, raising children, children are, are doing things which are, are, are just causing you all kinds of uh, headaches and aggravation. And a person feels that there's a blockage stopping him or her from succeeding in this area. The time to daven, the time to daven is Leil HaSeder, Seder night, both nights. He, he says even more than Yom Kippur. And he says, even if God forbid there's a decree, an oath from Hashem on a person regarding a certain thing, even if he or she cannot get a complete Yeshua salvation, 
No one goes out of Seder night empty-handed. Your tefillahs, your prayers will relieve the situation somewhat. On this night, a person can break their bad mazel. This is very powerful. So have that in mind. Personal prayers, Seder night, this coming Friday night, this coming Matzah Shabbos. Everyone has something going on in their life where you know someone. And just daven for them. It's a very, very powerful time of tefillah. Next, the simonim. Rabbi, specifically daven during... At the Seder? What does that mean? At the Seder. Of... You dive in at, at the Seder. Anytime you feel inspired. Anytime you feel inspired. You know, sometimes you have a situation and you feel like that you're, in, you're inspired to do something. It could be, sometimes it, it, it could be by Manish Tana. It, it could be by Hisha Amda. It could be by opening the door for Eli Yoha Navi. You know, these are special times. Any times when you see your family, they're all together. And, 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 and not just for, you know, God forbid bad things to be grateful for things. The person has to be grateful. You see your family together, you can go away for Yanta, and you should tell your family, we have to all be grateful to Hashem that we can do this, that we can get together and everyone is here for Pesach. HaKara you know, people only daven a lot of times when things are not going well, God forbid. But when things are going well, that's when you really have to daven. I remember once in our Yom Kippur davening, I gave Pesicha to this young man. He, was, he comes from a very wonderful family and he has everything he needs basically so he i call, call him for for Pesicha, opening up the ark and he, he whispers in my ear rabbi i don't need anything why don't you give this honor to someone who needs something i said i said steve that's why i'm giving it to you because i want you to keep what you have it's such an important concept every single day we say modem thank you hashem for something in your life you say you have to say baruch hashem every single day people forget People forget, and sometimes Hashem sends someone like a, a message. Sometimes a person goes to a doctor. There's a famous story with Rabbi Vig de Milde. You go to a doctor, and the doctor is concerned about something. And then, then you come back later, and, and the doctor says, everything, Baruch Hashem, I love when doctors say this, it's GMG, Gurnish me Gurnish. So what happened from four weeks ago? So Rabbi Vig de Milde says, something could have been there. It was a wake-up call from Hashem. Hashem says, listen. Where have you been? Talk to me. You have to, you have to listen to your messages in life. And when things are going well, every single day we say, Modani, thank you, Hashem, for this. Thank you, I can get up. Thank you, I have a job. You have to thank Hashem at least once a day, say Baruch Hashem every single day. Also at the Seder, we thank Hashem for things that we have in our life. In many families, before they start the Seder, they go around the table and everyone and they ask everyone, you know, if you're conducting the Seder, it's preparation. Ahead of time, tell people, by the way, before the Seder starts, we want to go around the table and someone should say something that they're very grateful for this year. Say something that you're grateful for. It could be the smallest things, you know. A child can say, I'm so grateful. I have this incredible teacher. I'm in third grade. I have a great teacher. Another child can say, I'm so happy that I'm, 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 I'm together with my, with my cousins. Something. Everyone should say something. Because, you know, hakara sato, gratitude is such an important concept, but we just always forget about it. So that, 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 that's a very good question you asked, Jacob. The next point, how do we start the Seder? It's called the Simonim. Everyone, what are the simonim, the symbols? In our Rosh Hashanah, we have simonim, we dip the apple in the honey. What are, what are the simonim on, on Seder night? Everyone knows this by heart. Kadesh or chas. By the way, this is a rhyme. If you say it like in this way, you'll know how it rhymes. Kadesh or chas, karpas yachatz. Magid rochza, motzi matza. Moror korech, shulchan orech. Tzafon borech, halel nirza. And halel nirza rhymes with motzi matza. So why do we start the Seder with the 15 signs? This is like ways, ways, because you cannot go out of order over here. You have to go according to, to the Seder. And the word Seder means order. Seder means clarity. It's another lesson from Seder night. We all need clarity in life. Someone's making an important decision. You're dating someone. You ask Hashem for clarity. I should make the right thing. You're looking for a new job. You're looking to move. Hashem, I need clarity. Can you please give me clarity? Seder night. Seder means order. We ask Hashem, can we please, can I have, please have clarity in my life? 15 steps. Why 15? 15 is a big number. Shiramalas, 15 Shiramalas, but also 15, the brachas, the blessings from the Birchas Kohanim. If a Rechacha Hashem be Yishma Recha, Yer Hashem Parnavi Lecha, Bichanecha Yisa Hashem Parnavi Lecha, Yosem Lecha Shalom. Fifteen words in Birchas Kohanim. 
Seder night, we're getting all the brachas from all the blessings from the Kohanim. It's like being in shul by Birchas Kohanim. So what are the first two simonim, the first signs? Kadesh, Urchas. What does Kadesh mean? Kadosh means holy. What does Urchas mean? It means to wash. We wash our hands without saying a bracha. We wash for the vegetables. It's the wrong order. If a person wants to be Kadosh holy, it should be Urchatz. First, we go to a mikvah, we wash ourselves, we cleanse ourselves, and then we are Kadosh. So why is Seder night, why is Kadesh first? So again, a beautiful explanation over here is that on Seder night, we're sitting at the table of Malachim, of kings, and the Malachim from, and the angels are coming down to, to be with us. Every single Shachris, we say the prayer, they open up their mouths Bikadusha Uvatahara with Kadusha's holiness and purity. Seder night, you just have to show up. You don't have to, you don't have to cleanse yourself. First, just showing up. It's an automatic cleansing process. That's why even the most secular Jews they have a Seder. Why? There's something in the Neshama, the soul of every Jew, the Pintilayir, the spark of that Jew, they're drawn to the Seder. You know, there's an expression, 90% are just showing up. You got to show up. You never know what's going to happen on Seder night. That was the Simonim. Next lesson, Karpas, dipping. Now, why do we dip? We dip twice on Seder night. What's the first dipping? We dip Karpas, other vegetables from the ground. Some people use potatoes, parsley, celery. We, we dip the Karpas in salt water and the Moror in the Charosis. Okay, everyone, everyone knows this. Why do we dip? fascinating insight. Now I'm going to be quoting some uh, some lessons from our sages and the Zohar says when you quote the words of a holy sage who's already in the world of truth, the Talmud says sifsosis of their lips are moving in the grave. You're bringing them life once again and because you bring them life once again, mida kanega mida, measure for measure, they will bring the person who are listening to all their, their, their thoughts they will bring your, your words to life to the heavenly throne. So after tonight's class, I'll be quoting a lot of the great sages, also quoting from the Rebetzin. The next prayer we'll be saying tonight, whether it's my the, the bedtime Shema, they will be taking your prayers to the heavenly throne because you gave them life once again. They will take your prayers and give it life once again. So why do we dip? The first dipping is basically to remember how the brothers of Yosef dipped his coat in blood, the Kasonis Pasim. Remember, he was dipped in blood. How can he dip his coat in blood? There was jealousy, animosity, and because they dipped his coat in blood, that's how he ended up in Egypt. That's how he ended up over there. So, and 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 if you look at the in the, in the Chumash and Pasha's Vayesha, it describes the Kasonis Pasim, Lashan Kali Milas, which means it's a garment of fine wool. The next line of Rashi is um, it's mind-boggling. Rashi says the, the Kasonis passing is, is like karpas. Karpas. Karp, what is karpas? A fine woolen tunic. Karpas is a fine woolen tunic. So they dipped Yosef's coat in blood, and the coat represents animosity and hatred, and that's how it got into Egypt. And the second temple was destroyed because sinas chinam, Jews didn't get along. Do you know that every year, the first night of Pesach, which is this year, Friday night, is always the same night as the first night of Tisha B'Av? Can you believe this? This year, unless Mashiach comes, Tisha B'Av is on Shabbos, but we, we, we push it off till, till Saturday night. Check it out. And that's another reason why we have the egg on the Seder table. The egg is a sign of mourning. God forbid someone's mourning. What is the first meal to eat when you come back from the cemetery? An egg. Because we're mourning because we don't have the temple. And how do we get, how do we make tikkun? How do we fix the problem of Yosef's brothers? What do we do? The second dipping. What's the second dipping? More in the charosis? By the killing of the firstborn, the last plague, what happens over there? So it, so it says in the Torah, God says to Moshe, tell the Jewish people, take a gudas ezok, a bundle, a bundle of reeds, a bundle, a guda means together, together. When Jews are together, you dip that into blood, put it on your doorpost, and that will protect the Jewish people. And that's how we get, that's how we get out of the situation. People don't get along. When Jews get along, no one can, can defeat us. And this is the lesson of Pesach night. And that's why if a person feels that maybe this past year they got into some kind of dispute, the machlokas with someone before Pesach, call them up. Listen, I would like to make shalom. 
it's even greater than Yom Kippur. I would like to make shalom with you and your family. Let's just move on. Please, look, there's so many things going on in this world. It's scary. Let's, let's, let us just make shalom. Next lesson, yachatz. What is yachatz? We break the middle matzah. Why do we break the middle matzah? Now here's, here we have the matzah. Try, if you can, try everyone to try to have shmura matzah. Very tasty. If you want, you can heat it up in the oven before Pesach. And it's very, very nice and crispy. So why the three matzahs? Many a reason. One reason is Kohen, Levi, Yisrael. The middle matzah is, is split. Levi was split between the Kohanim and the Levim. The other reason, the other reason why we have three matzahs is because Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. If it's Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, the three forefathers, why are we splitting Yitzchak? Why does Yitzchak get split into half? It's a fascinating, fascinating Gemara in the Book of Shabbos. The Gemara goes like this. Before the Gula, before the redemption, Hashem is going to speak to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Should I bring the Jewish people? Should I bring the redemption? Should I bring Mashiach? So Avram says no. Yaakov says no. And then Hashem says to Yitzchak, what do you have to say? So the Gemara says, Hashem says to Yitzchak, he says, Bonai, he says, Bonecha, your children have sinned. And Yitzchak says, my children, not your children? What do you mean? Master the universe, they're your children also. So Yitzchak starts to negotiate with God. And, uh, and Yitzchak says, he's like a lawyer. He says, Hashem, what's the normal lifespan of a person? King David says, what, 70 years. He says, take away the first 20 years because a Jew is not, a person is not punished for the first 20 years. How many years are left? 50 are left. Take away 25 years because it's nighttime. You can't sin at night. 25 years are left. Take away 12 and a half years because people are praying, people are eating. You can't sin. 12 and a half years left, Hashem. Hashem, you take it for yourself. And if you don't want to take it for yourself, Hashem, I'll split it with you. you. Hear this? I'll split it with you. And that's why God says, I'm going to listen to the words of Yitzchak. And we split Yitzchak into two. Because of Yitzchak, we're going to bring the redemption. And Yitzchak says also, Hashem, by the way, by the way, I offered myself as a, as a sacrifice on the binding of Isaac. And by the way, I gave unconditional love to my son Esau. If I can give unconditional love to that son Esau, you can forgive the Jewish people. Fine. So that's why we split. So what do we do with the matzah? Yachas. We take the matzah, we split it into two. The smaller piece goes back in between the two big pieces. And what happens to the bigger piece? This is the afi komen. Okay. This is, and, and what do we do with the afi komen? We hide the afi komen because Yitzhak was the one who brought the initial redemption. And now he's going to bring the future redemption. But the future redemption is hidden. Safan is hidden. We do not know when it's going to come. That's why we hide the afi komen. Then what happens? This, come, this, 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 this doesn't even make sense. We tell the children, now it's time to steal, to steal the Yafi Komen. What's going on here? Do you tell your children to steal? You know, in many families, by the way, the, the tradition is they, they tell the children to take, to remove, to hide. You don't tell children to steal anything. So why does it say the word steal on Seder night? What's the lesson? So I heard from Rav Shuli Bornstein, incredible, incredible insight from the Holy Chassam Sofer. You have to, this, this again, mind boggling. This will change your, the way you, you, you look at the Seder. The Gemara Pesachim says that Rav told Rav Asi, he gave him advice in life never live in a city where there are no dogs. Why? Because when there are dogs living in a city, dogs prevent robberies. Because, you know, when you have a dog and someone comes to your home and you ring the bell, the dogs, the dogs stop barking and dogs prevent robberies. In Egypt, Egypt was full of dogs. And when the Jews left Egypt, guess what happened? Well, Yechvat's Kel, the dogs did not bark. So the Chassam Sofer said, the reason why we tell the children to steal on Pesach night, to tell them and to remember the great miracle that happened on, in Pesach in Egypt, that even though there were dogs, the dogs did not bark. If you wanted to steal, you could have stolen in Egypt because Hashem silenced the dogs. That's the reason why we tell the children to steal. And by the way, if a person is ever afraid, Beautiful. ever afraid of dogs, you know, my father, I remember we grew up in North Windermere. There was one person in the shoe. My father would always make a lot of house calls. 
he could bring chalas to people. I mean, he, he, my father was like a rabbi's rabbi. He was such an incredible man of chesed, of kindness. And there was one family that had very, he had two, two big German shepherds. And my father told me in, in, in the Holocaust, these German shepherds would be jumping on him. He, he was very frightened. He would always tell them, please lock up the dogs. And people are, rabbi, they're very nice. Do me a favor. Do me to lock up the dogs. If you're afraid of a dog, so what should you say if you're afraid of a dog? You say the sentence, when the Jewish people left Egypt, the dogs did not bark. That's what you have to do. You say it in English. When the Jewish people left Egypt, the dogs did not bark. But we're not finished with this. The Chassam saw, again, the Chassam saw, his lips are moving in the grave. The Chassam saw for son, the Kassav Sofer, when he was 10 years old, it was Seder night. He says to his father, Tati, why do we say steal? We don't steal. And yes, the holy Hassam Sofa, the holy Tzaddik, and his father looked at him, this little 10-year-old boy, and he didn't answer him. He didn't answer him. And the next night, by the second Seder, the little boy asked again, Tati, father, why do we steal the Afikoma? We don't steal. Now, then his father said, I'll tell you why. And he told him the reason, because it, it reminds us of the great miracle that the dogs did not bark. If you wanted to steal, you could have stolen. It's a great miracle. And then the little boy said, Tati, so then why didn't you tell me this last night? And the Chassam Sofa gave him this lesson for life. We should always remember this. Pesach night, he got to Levincha to tell your children lessons for life. And he told his son, if when it comes to Judaism and mitzvahs, even if you don't understand the reason behind the mitzvah, you still do it. Even if you don't understand something, you still do it. That's why we say, there's no God like our God. First you accept. What's the next verse? Me kelokeinu. Who is like Hashem? Who is like Hashem? And again, the Kassam Sova, his lips are moving in the grave. Tonight's prayer after, after this class is right to the Kisia cover, right to the heavenly throne. This Tuesday is the yard side of the Shalah HaKadosh, the great Sadiq. And he says the word Yachas is spelled Yud Ches Sadi. It spells for the, the three holy cities in Eretz Yisrael. Yud is Yerushalayim, Ches is Hebron, and Sadiq is Tzafas, this holy city of Tzafas. Next, Manishtana. Oh, everyone knows Manishtana. Everyone gets pumped for Manishtana. Who's saying Manishtana? What's the, you know? By the way, if a person sitting by themselves got the bid on Seder night, yeah, you still have to ask Manishtana because the, the, the Haggadah has to be asked in a, in a question form because a good question demands an answer. What was the first question mentioned in the Torah? When Hashem says to Adam, Adam, why are you hiding? Ayeka, where are you? And Ayeka also means, what happened to you? When you ask a person, like, what happened to you? They have to, they have to answer. Not just screaming at a person, what happened? What happened to you? And when you have a good question and someone gives you a good answer, you're going to remember the answer. And that's why we have this, the, the Manishtana, because the Manishtana is the preamble for the answers of Adam Hayinu, we were slaves in Egypt. So Manishtana, who says Manishtana? The youngest, uh, anyone could say Manishtana. No laws in my family, everyone would go around. The older children who ask the person who conducts the Seder, Manishtani, you ask your father, you ask your uncle, someone, anyone, anyone can say it, one person can say it, but someone has to say Manishtana. This is a very moving thought. This is from, the, again, the Orachayim, this is from the Orachayim Akkadosh, lips are moving in the grave. And many Haggadahs, and many Haggadahs, right before Manishtana, the words are written like this, Kan Haben Shoel. This is where the child's asking. This is where the child asks. The Orachayim Akkadah says, Seder night, the night of prayer, bigger than Yom Kippur. If couples are having fertility issues, this is where you ask Hashem for a child. Kan haben shal. When if you have children, this is where you ask Hashem for mazel and success for your children. You say private prayer. Kan haben shal. So my father would During always, Manishtana? During right, before, Manishtana? right before Manishtana. Okay, Many have okay. got it, it says, this is where the child is. And we're all children. You ask Hashem for anything. You ask Hashem for success for yourself, because you're also a child. And Hashem, we say, Hashem is Avinu Sheva Shemayim, a father in heaven. Personal prayer, words that come from the heart, go to the heart. My father told me many years ago, if I see an article in the, in, that, that, that talks to me, 
cut it out and save it because you never know where you, when, when you may go back to it. It's around 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I saw this article. I put it in my Pesach, uh, my Pesach portfolio, so to say. It's unbelievable. This is from Orachim Makadosh. This is the letter. Two years ago, in a letter to the editor of the Hebrew daily Hamodia, a young man wrote, after being married for a few years without, with being blessed, without being blessed with children, he went to his Rebbe for a bracha. And the Rebbe recommended that this young man learn the Or HaChaim HaKadosh Sefer on the leaving of Egypt on, if on Seder night. And that will bring you a blessing for a child. My parents saw the letter, and since I needed a salvation, a big miracle, they recommended I try the Segula. After the Seder, I opened up the Holy Orachayim to the portion of Bo, where the words begin, he got to Levincha, and you should teach it to your children. It jumped out at me. The Orachayim says, if a person delves into this, into this chapter, they will merit fulfilling the mitzvah of having a son. I was overwhelmed when I read this, and I promised myself that if this segula would work for me, I would publicize it. And Baruch Hashem, I would like to tell everyone, the bracha of the Arachayim HaKadosh was fulfilled, and this year we had a son. And may this bracha be a bracha for many, many people. Very emotional uh, words from Arachayim HaKadosh. Again, lips are moving in the grave. Next, Amr Rabbi Yolaza ben Azahir. Rabbi Yolaza ben Azahir says, I am like 70 years old. I am like, what do you mean I'm like 70 years old? When someone says, how old are you? I'm like, I'm like 25, I'm like, what do you mean? Either you are or you're not. What does it mean I'm like 70 years old? This is based upon the famous Gemara and Brachas. Rabbi Gamliel was demoted from being the Nasi. He was being demoted from being the prince of the Jewish people. And they needed to find, you think there were politics in shuls today? There were politics there also. <laughs> So they needed to find a, a new a Nasi, a new prince. So they went to all well, the rabbi. Rabbi Akiva was, he, he could, right, the first asked Rabbi Akiva, he, 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 was, he could have done it, but he didn't have the merit of the forefathers because he, he, from his family background. So he asked Rabbi Yalazar ben Azariah, do you want to be the new prince? And they asked him, you know what he said? The Gemara says, I have to get back to you because I have to ask my wife. Do you hear this? I have to ask my wife. King Solomon says, Chachmas Noshim Bon Sabesa. The wisdom of the Jewish women, they build the Jewish home. They build the Jewish home. And he asked his wife, and his wife said, one of the things she said was, you're too young. He was 18 years old. 18. And by the way, it says in the commentary, it was his Hebrew birthday. On your Hebrew birthday, you should, everyone should know when the Hebrew birthday is. It's a tremendous time of mazel. You can give brachas and you can get brachas. On your own personal birthday, call people up. By the way, it's my birthday. I'm, I want to give you a bracha. Wow, your birth, you're giving me a bracha? That's amazing. Try to find out when your Hebrew birthday is. And she said, you're too young. So what happened? So overnight, 18 strands of white went into his beard and overnight he turned into an older man. So that's when he said, I'm like 70 years old, he turned old overnight. But why I'm like 70? He was 18. Because the, the commentaries tell us that he was a Gilgal and reincarnation of Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet. And Shmuel died when he was 52. 52 and 18 is 70. And it says, I'm like 70 years old. How do you say the word, the word sh year in Hebrew? Shana. How do you spell Shana in Hebrew? Shin, Nun, Hey. You rearrange the letters. The Nun stands for Nishmas, the Neshama, the soul of Shmuel Hanavi. I am the soul of Samuel the prophet. And the Talmud says in the book of Brachas that who is Shmuel's mother? Chana. We know to read the story of Chana, the Haftorah, the, on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. And it says when Shmuel grew up, his, his mother's house always went with him. What does that mean? Because Chana said, as Hanar Hazeh, I daven for this son. A mother's intuition, a mother's teaching, a mother's prayer for their children are always taking their children no matter where they go in life. And when they get married, they bring the house of their mother with them. That's the story of Elizabeth and Isaiah. The four sons, Baruch HaMakam, Baruch Hu, Baruch Torah, and Baruch. We say the word Baruch four times. Why do we say the word Baruch four times? Echad Chacham, the wise son, 
Echad Rasha, the evil son, Echad Tom, the simple son, and then who's the last son? The one who cannot ask any questions. So our sages ask a question. If we're speaking about the four sons, just say the word Baruch once. Blessed are the four sons. Why do we have to say the word Bracha, 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 Bracha four times? We never like to waste any words. Rashim and Schwab, lips are moving in the grave. Rashim and Schwab, an unbelievable insight to the four sons. He says like this, sometimes you go to a Seder, a father or a grandfather, you're looking at the whole family, and you're looking at your family Seder night, and you see sometimes your children, a boy, a girl, grandchildren, and you see that this is not the grandchild I hope for. Because the kid, you know, who knows how they're dressed, who knows what they're with, they're doing in life, and they're causing parents agmas nefesh aggravation, and the grandchildren are doing crazy things. And you sit there in front of your Seder, and you don't know what to do. Hashim and Schwab says, Baruch HaMakam, Baruch Hu, Bracha is mentioned four times because every child is a Bracha. And Seder night is a night of Amuna, it's a night of faith. Yeshua Hashem Kehera, finally, the blink of an eye, Hashem can turn things around. It's a night to pray for your family. You never, ever give up hope. But Rabbi Salavetrik, the briskerov, he would always tell the story. He would say, he, some, he sees this over and over again. You have, you have families, you have children, three, four, or five kids, and you have like three or four for the children. You know, they're, they're, they're doing great all the time. And there's one child always struggling. Tutors, aggravation, and they don't show up to school, and it, 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 everything's like, it's a mess. And, and he sees this all the time. Fast forward 20 years, that one child who was always struggling becomes a superstar of the family. He says, you know why that happens? You know why that happens? Because every single Friday night, when the mother lights Shabbos candles, she's praying for her children. The first three or four, she prays. But for that struggling child, she cries. There's nothing like the tears of a Yiddish mama. You just watch when women pray. You see how they pray for their children. Like one child needs a little extra tears, and she and those tears go to the heavens above. It says the gates of tears are never closed. And he sees, he sees this all the time, all the time. That one child who was always struggling, all of a sudden, like this, child becomes a superstar. Why? Mother's tears. Mother's tears are always answered. One of the one of the, fam- the great stories I like telling over regarding children. I have a friend who who told me that when his son was like a teenager, he was the most wildest kid. He, they call him the, the wild thing. He was wild. You know when a kid, when a teenager could drive their parents crazy, all kinds of stuff, drinking, smoking, out at night, trouble in school. You know, and, but, he, but I spoke to the son and this son told me that every time he was suspended from school, his father came down and his father screamed at the principal, how dare you, how dare you throw out my son from school? My father always had my back. My father never gave up on me. And then he gets engaged as kid to a girl who's even more wilder than him, more worse than him. Crazy, you know, driving parents crazy. So at the engagement party, so my friend Ted goes over to the girl's father and says, by the way, Mazel tov, no backs, no backs. And the girl's father says to him, by the way, no backs here either. Fast forward four years from the, when they get married. Today, this couple is the go-to couple where they live. Chesed, mitzvahs, classes are learning, tzedakah. They are the couple of the neighborhood. You know why? The prayers of a Jewish mother and the father never gave up upon their children. Never give up on the children. Rabbi Yisach a friend, the Rosh Hashiva Ner Yisrael told a story many years ago, and it was like, I guess it was like one of those old stories. It was called The Yellow Ribbon. It was about this boy. He lived on a farm in Kansas. And after he graduated high school, he told his parents that he wants to go cross country. And his father, mother didn't say anything, you know, what she said, well, okay, fine, but speak to your father, speak to dad. And his father, the father said, you can't go cross country. I need you to help me on the farm. And the boy said, dad, I'm going, I'm going. And the, and the father said to the son, son, if you leave this house right now, you'll, I'm never going to let you back. Never going to let you back. And the boy, yeah, he was stubborn. He was in action. He left, he left. 
And when he left, you know, two months, three months, he calls his mother once in a while, you know, what's going on, how's dad? And the mom says, you know, dad is still angry that you left. After like six months, this boy wants to come home. And he calls his mother, he says, mom, can I come home? You know, if someone works for you and they steal from you, it's very hard to bring them back. But if a child does something wrong, there's always a place in the heart of a father and a mother. The door is always open. Door is always open. So what happened over here was he he call he calls his mother and he's like and 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 she says, can I can, he said, can I can I come back? And mom said and the mother said, listen, I'm not sure, but you know we live they lived in the town. The town was called. Abilene, 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 Kansas, a small town in Kansas. And the, the train station has a small train station and, and there's a big oak tree by the train station. And the mother says, when you pass by the train station, the train stops at the hometown. Look at that oak tree. If you see a yellow ribbon on that oak tree, that's the sign that dad says you can come home. So he goes home, he starts, he starts going on his journey, he's going home, going through all these small towns, and he's getting closer and closer to his hometown. And he meets a stranger on the train. And he says to the stranger, tell, tell the stranger his story. And he's getting closer and closer, and he tells the stranger, do me a favor, sir. I'm so scared to look if there's a yellow ribbon on the tree. I'm going to put my head down. When the train stops, can you please let me know if there's a yellow ribbon on the tree. And the train stops and the man looks out and he says, son, you wouldn't believe the sight I'm looking at now. He says, what, what, what? There's a yellow ribbon on every branch. There's a yellow ribbon on every branch. So I always get emotional with this story. I don't know, I feel like 20 years already. But I think that, that the lesson is on the night of Seder, the night of Amuna, Hashem says to his children, come home. A time to come home. We have the Makos, the 10 plagues. You all know the 10 plagues, Dam, Tzifadeya, Kinem, blood, frogs. Which was the worst of the plagues? The worst of the plagues. So one of my favorite uh, thoughts on, on the plagues was from of Yaakov Galinsky. Lips are moving in the grave, everybody. Yaakov Galinsky, the famous Magi from Yerushalayim, he said the worst plague was Choshech darkness. Why was Choshech the worst plague? Because it says by Choshech, it says in the Torah below, Ro Ish Es Achiv. One person, even two brothers, cannot even recognize each other. That's how dark it was. People are all alone. But every single plague, whether it's blood, frogs, lice, people could commiserate with each other. You know, oh, this blood is terrible. The frogs, this and that. Let's see, even when you have, let's say you have a, a there, there, there's a blackout. You go to your neighbor. This is terrible. But when you're all alone, when you're all alone, and there's no one to talk to, it's the worst feeling. And by Choshech, there was no one to talk to. You know, the expression, misery loves company. There's no company. And that's why the Gemara says in the, in the, in, in, with the story of Chuni Hamagal, Chuni Hamagal was a sage, he fell asleep for 70 years. When he woke up, he went into his shul, went into his town, he says, I'm Chuni. Who? Chuni? Chuni's been dead. What are you? Who are you? A crazy person? And nobody wanted to talk to Chuni. And Chuni said one of the most famous expressions in the Talmud, Nobody wanted to speak to him. You know what Chuni says? O Chavrusa, O Misusa. Either be my friend or his death. Chuni died from a broken heart. So we, I think the lesson over here is if some people who just sometimes they're alone, they're hurting, everyone has something going on. Everyone knows someone who could use a, a pickup call. I really believe that's why Hashem invented texting. Because you could text a person by not bothering them and say, by the way, I'm thinking about you. I'm checking in. How are you doing? Someone I knew this week went to some major surgery. I texted him and he says, I'm, I'm Rabbi. I said, very difficult, but hopefully I'll, I'll, be, I'll be getting over this hump soon. And I said, oi, everyone is davening for you. And he gave me a thumbs up on the text. I like that. I like that. Everyone is davening for me. That's such an important concept. But Mordechai Shapiro the famous Rav in Miami Beach, lips are moving in the grave. What an incredible insight. On Parashas Par in the Haftorah, it says the words, and the, and the earth, the earth, what does neshama mean? Was, des was desolate, there was desolation. 
Haneshama means desolation. The word Haneshama is the same letters as Haneshama. So how do you change Haneshama, desolation, to Haneshama, which means life and fire and a human being? How do you do that? Do you, you, you change the vowel. You change the vowel. You go from a, a Kamat Haneshama, a, a Patah Haneshama, to a Kamat. What does this the Kamat mean? That's a little support. When it's a little support, a little support under the leg, you, get, you change neshama desolation to neshama to a life. We'll have well, one more, one more lesson, and then uh, we'll have a review, and then we're going to I'll give everyone a bracha. I see it's getting a little late. Sorry about that. Opening the door for Elio Hanavi. Elio Hanavi. That's always a highlight. You know, when I was when I was, when I was growing up in my in my home. This was a very special time with my mother, the Rebbitson. My mother, you know, she everyone kn knew her as besides being a great Torah teacher, she had this kayak, incredible power of prayer. She always had her Tehillim with her. When she spoke at Fort Hood, the biggest army base in the United States, she had to go through security and she, always, and she was carrying her Tehillim and she kept on buzzing, kept on buzzing. And finally, the, the MP, the military police officer says, ma'am, what is that in your hand? It keeps, what is that? It keeps, it's something, is that, why is that buzzing? And she says to the soldier, this is my ammunition. The Tehillim, this is my ammunition. And when she put the Tehillim down, she walked through, there was no buzzing. Amazing story. So why did we open the door for Eli Yohan Novi? So we read yesterday in the Haftarah, it says, Hinei Anochi Hashem, so I'm going to send Eli Yohan Novi before this great day to bring the redemption. So when I was growing up, opening the door, Pesach night, it's called Leil Shemurim, the, the night of watching. Hashem protects the Jewish people, he opened the door. And we would, we would sit around the table, and we pour the fourth cup, and my mother would tell all the children, Elio Hanavi, she would prepare us. She, it, was, it was like, it was like a, a moment, you just can't forget this. Elio Hanavi is coming into the house. I need you to ask El Yohanavi, because the prayer of children is very powerful. And she gave us a list. Pray for this one, pray for this one, pray for that one. Parents, pray for the health of your parents, for the grandparents. Open the door and they make sure you pray. So we all opened the door and then we left the door open because that's how we do it. That's how we did it. We went to the table and I remember watching my mother. Her eyes were closed. Like you knew something was going on. There was, some, there was such a connection, the kavana, the, the, the connection with Eli Yohanovi in the room, Pesach night, Seder night, the night of faith, the night of prayer, bigger than Yom Kippur. I just watched this, watched her, how she would, there was silence in the room and she was just praying with such intensity. And then she'd also, okay, Kindleluch, go, escort Eli Yohanovi out. Because when a person, we learned from, from Abraham, our forefather, when a person walks into your house, you always walk them out also. You always escort a person. You always escort them out. And then we would come back and we have the fourth cup. And this, this, this was the memory I always have, Elio Hanavi. Now, who opens the door for Elio Hanavi? Doesn't make a difference. Different customs. In some families, a girl who's looking for a shidduch, she opens the door. Rebetzin Kanievsky, Rebetzin Batsheva Kanievsky, the lips are moving in the grave. Baruch Haba, she would say, welcome. She opened the door. She opened the door. It doesn't make a difference. Anyone can, anyone can open the door. And my father-in-law, also lips are moving in the grave, Yitzchak ben Yosef, his custom was that after we, 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 before we drink the, the, the fourth cup, after Eliyahu Hanavi, he takes the cup of Eliyahu Hanavi and he pours a little bit of wine in everyone's cup at the Seder. It's a beautiful minog. Anyone can do this. So you have the blessings from Elijah's cup, Elio's cup, in your own cup. So again, say the memories. This is a, I, I, this this letter was around 25 years ago. I just found it this week, by the way. It was written by Avraham Rosenfeld. Who is he? I don't know. But this is the letter. It says in night he, he called it a, a, the memory of opening the door for Elio Hanavi. It was 1944 during World War II, and we were preparing for Pesach in our Williamsburg apartment. As usual, we had our sedarm with our uncle and his family. There was a problem. My cousin, Moshe, was serving in the U.S. Army. 
he had called and he said that he would try to make it home for Seder, but he did not know if he'd receive a pass from his sergeant. Ever Pesach came and went when we started the Seder without Cousin Moshe. We were so disappointed that he wouldn't be there, but it was a time of war and one had to accept life as it was, not as it should be. We finished the meal and I, being the youngest, had the honor of opening the door for Eliyahu Hanavi. I opened the door and I screamed, he's here, he's here, he's here. My, my wonderful cousin Moshe stood there with a smile upon his face in his army uniform. And he said, good young to everyone. I made it home. It seemed he had received the pass and it was getting late right before Yontif and he, he, did not want to, he did not want to violate Yontif. He walked across the Williamsburg Bridge to greet us and he heard us through the screen door and he waited to make his grand entrance by the, the opening the door of Elio Hanovi and it was truly a Chag Kosh Vesameach. And then he says, it would be nice if we could freeze that memory in time, but we know in real life, not every story has a happy ending. Several months later, on my way home from Yeshiva, a neighbor met me and told me to go to my uncle's house. And I asked why. And he told me, not, don't ask any questions, just go. And this time when I opened the door, there was no smiling faces waiting for me. My uncle and his family were sitting on the floor and the candle flickered in a glass. The dreaded telegram had arrived. The army had notified my uncle that my cousin Moshe had been killed in action in France Friday, fighting the Germans. And he concludes through the ensuing decades, I had, been, so I had the merit to attend many Pesach Sidorim. With the passage of time, many events have faded and have been forgotten. But when the time comes to open the door for Elio Hanavi, I will always remember my cousin's smiling face with the words, good yantov, everyone. I made it home. He is here. He is here. Yehizich and Baruch, may his memory be for a blessing. Okay, so now back, in, I just want to just review now before I give everyone a bracha. Sorry about that, I get emotional from these stories. It's, I don't know what it is. Pesach, family, that's what it is. So let's review all this, the lessons we learned tonight. We, we, we mentioned the power of prayer of Seder night, even bigger than Yom Kippur. We mentioned the Simanim, the 15 words, like the blessings of the Kohanim. Seder night, the blessings, the blessings will be with you. And we mentioned the dipping, the coat of Yosef, and we dipped, the, we dipped his coat in blood. And that's the reason why we have an egg on the table. And that's the reason, also, by the way, there's something called a blood libel. In ancient, in the the, the non-Jews accused the Jews of killing Christian children using the blood to bake matzah. That's such a bizarre story. Why? Because they dipped Yosef's coat, coat in blood. And when there's animosity and hatred, these, these rumors start to happen. We have Yachat breaking the middle matzah. Remember how Yitzchak, we, break, we split Yitzchak into two because Yitzchak negotiated with Hashem and Yitzchak is going to bring the redemption. We mentioned what it means to steal why we say to steal? Because the dogs did not bark in Egypt. We mentioned Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. He was 18. He was a reincarnation of Shmuel Hanavi. And the word Shana stands for the neshama of Shmuel Hanavi. We mentioned Baruch HaMakam. Bless, we say the word blessing four times for the four sons. Every child is a blessing. Every child is a blessing at the table. We mentioned Choshech. The worst plague was darkness. And we mentioned about the neshama. And the Shama, the Shama, how the Shama is desolation, and the Shama, the Kamats, a little support can give a person inspiration. Texting gives a person help. And we mentioned about opening the door for Elio Hanavi. And we mentioned about the Rebbitzin. And we mentioned about the story of the soldiers. So I just want to conclude with a bracha. I want to give everyone a bracha that may your Seder this coming Friday night, Pesach and Matah Shabbos, may your prayers be fulfilled. Whoever needs health, Hashem should give refuas health, Yeshua salvation. Whoever needs a shidduch, Hashem should give you clarity. Also, by the way, when it comes to shidduchim, pray for things before you need them. When your children are small, pray when they're ready to start dating, ready to go to school, Hashem should guide them to the proper places. Everyone prays when you need something. Pray before, it's called preventive prayer. Everyone should have good panasa, easy way to make a living. 
we should have get, we have children, nachas from children and grandchildren. And my Rebson will say nachas from ourselves. May the words of the of the prophets that we read yesterday from Malachi in the Haftorah, the Heshev Lev Avos Abonim, may Hashem return the hearts of fathers to their children, the Lev Bonim Al Avos, and the children should come back to their families. And we're going to be saying the Bracha Barei Pri Hagafen four times, right? Hagafen, how do you spell Hagafen? Hey, Gimel, Hey, Nun. What's the Bracha Hagafen? Hey stands for Hatzlacha, good luck. Gimel, Gesund, we should all be healthy. Pay Parnasa, we should make a good living. Nun, Nachas, Nachas, we should all have joy and happiness. And I want to wish everyone a good Yant V'chakosheh V'sameach. And Rabbi Sol Salanta would always conclude a speech, lips are moving in the grave again. He said that just one person learns, has learned one thing from the words I've said tonight. I just hope that one person is myself. Good night. Hakashiv Samir, thank you for the other new synagogue. And beautiful. Thank you for having beautiful. me. Uh, just one second, Rabbi Babbage. Do you have any Rabbi Babbage you want to add something or Rachel? Uh, Rabbi? Yes, I uh, just want to thank Rabbi Younger for truly uh, inspiring uh, evening. It definitely got us all um, elevated. Um, I myself learned many, many new insights, which I've never known before. And who knew that you could toast matzah before you eat it? I think that <laughs> might be the uh, most important lesson I, I learned. Okay, as long as you got one thing from today. <laughs> It's good. It's good. I um, always toast, yeah. No, but I was particularly uh, moved about that, how Pesach night is a night of tefillah. Um, I never fully understood that, but uh, thank you so much for um, your insights and, and your inspiration. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Rachel, Rachel Barry. Uh, magnificent job. It's going to be a great Passover because you gave us great inspiration. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. Nobody makes it. Nobody makes a, a beautiful, a beautiful shear like you. You're terrific. Shabar, you're the best. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rabbi. Bye. Okay, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. We'll get you the recording tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.